monkeys right there. There might be a... Um, and then if you um, 
notice kids everywhere. Um, that's because we, we want them in the service. We, we want them knowing that they're a part of the larger church family. It's good for us to be reminded that the Lord gives life, spiritually and physically. Um, but prior to the sermon, those kindergarten and now have done this hallway for child care. There is a cry room behind the one-way glass there if you need it. And then our elementary age kids have a class every other week. And so first through fifth graders, you do have a class this week. And so after that second song before the sermon, you'll line up by the front doors for class this morning. Let me, let me pray for us, and we'll enter a time of worship for song. Father, we, we come dependent. We're grateful that there are not hoops for us to jump or sacrifices for us to make this morning, but knowing that we are dependent upon your grace and on your presence and upon your mercy. Lord, thank you that you meet with us. Thank you that your spirit is here moving among us. Lord, would you stir our hearts um, to have more affection for you? God, where there is sin that is hidden, God, would you shine a light on it and remind us that it's in your kindness that leads us to repentance, that we would confess and walk in the light. God, for those this morning who are hopeless, tired, broken, whether that is physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, Lord, that you would mend and be a balm to their soul this morning. For those who are delighting in you, Lord, would they continue to rejoice. Lord, we, we need you. Thank you that you see us. Thank you that we're not hidden from you. Would you minister and meet with us this morning for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hear God's call to worship through his word. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Stand with us and let's sing together this morning.
Lord, as we come to you to sing um, together, to encourage and build one another up, um, to see one another's faces, um, to catch up on a week that was um, maybe great and maybe difficult, uh, Lord, we're, we're blessed and honored to be a part of your family, um, your family that you have called to gather on a regular basis um, to do just those things, to encourage and build one another up, to let the word of Christ dwell richly in us. And that's our prayer today, God, is that your word would dwell richly among and in us, that we might let that uh, seed that you've planted overflow um, in, in words of life, in words of encouragement, in words of hope and faith to others around us. Um, Jesus, you are good to us this morning. May your word be life and breath and all that we need this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can have a seat. Our littlest guys are dismissed down this hallway for child care. And our big kids, grades one through five, have class today down the street at the well. So they can meet Dan at the door and head that way. this 
information that I hear about you. Turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be manager. And the manager said to himself, what do I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do, so that when I'm removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors, one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. And he said to another, how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill, and write eighty. The master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of life. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. One who is faithful in a very little in very little is also faithful in much, and one who is dishonest in very little is also dishonest in much. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you to true riches? And if you have not been faithful in that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for he either will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Right? It does not roll off the tongue like the prodigal son. Right? As you read through this, you're going, this, this doesn't strike in the same way. Um, so, let's, let's kind of set the scene as to what's going on here. Jesus is telling the story. That his, his focus is really kind of on the disciples at this point. Um, less the Pharisees, although the Pharisees are still hearing this. And, and basically, he tells the story of a, of a money manager, right? That would have been a servant um, of a wealthy, very wealthy individual. Very likely was not living in the same residence. This, this man probably had multiple properties and homes. And so the money manager is staying at one of the others. He's kind of overseeing the, the finances, the possessions, the property. And somewhere, he begins to mismanage. And so someone takes a message to the owner and says, Hey, this guy is he's stealing from you, right? He's taking from you. You need to deal with him. And so a message gets sent back to him. Hey, I need you to prep the book because I'm coming to check. And, you're, and I'm firing you. But there's this small window of time in there, right? Because they're not on the same property where he can begin to try to figure out what he's going to do. And we get to actually see his thoughts a little bit. And you can see the, the train of thought of just like, okay, I don't want to dig ditches. That's hard work. Right? And he's like, I, 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 he's lived a life of, of somewhat, even though it wasn't his own wealth, he's lived a life of, of comfort and ease and wealth. He's like, so I don't want to, I don't want to dig ditches. But I've lost my job. Well, I don't want to beg, because that would be even more shameful than digging ditches. And you can, you can almost feel and hear the panic coming over him as, what am I going to do? And then he has his eureka moment, right? And we see this where he says um, in verse, uh, verse 3, uh, or sorry, verse 4, I've decided what to do, right? He's like, okay, I know what I'm going to do. And he begins to to go through the list of accounts, and he goes to these other folks who owe the master money, and he begins to just negotiate with them. He's beginning to say, okay, I know this is what you owe, we're going we're to fudge the receipts a little bit, right? We're going to change those, and so you're going to owe less. And so we're talking significant amounts of money. When he tells the one that owes a hundred measures of oil, a hundred measures of oil is somewhere between 875 and 900 gallons olive oil. It would have been the olive oil from 150 trees. And it would have been equal to roughly three years salary for someone. So this isn't just you know, a few dollars. When he says to the one that owes wheat, this is um, equal to a hundred acres of grain, which is 1,100 bushels, and somewhere between eight and ten years salary. So these are significant amounts of money, significant debt that are owed, so we begin to see the amount of wealth that's being talked about. And what is he doing? He's, he's paving favor for himself. He knows he's about to be out. His job is lost. There's nothing he can do about it. But he's saying, there are other wealthy people out there. 
and maybe they can owe me. Maybe, maybe I can gain some favor and some appreciation so that when I need something, maybe they'll look to employ me or they'll invite me into their home, right? And he makes them say it out loud, right? How much do you owe my master? And they have to say 100 measures of oil or 100 measures of wheat and so on down the list. Why? He's making them complicit. Right, so then now when he goes back, he can say, remember when you, owe, when you owed all that? Remember the discount you got? I need something. Right, he's, he's kind of working this system here. So we get down, down to verse 8, and it, it turns a little bit. He says, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. So basically, we we're coming to the conclusion of this. The master gets there, sees what's taking place, and he goes, you got me. Right? It's one of those moments where um, you can almost see him like tipping his hat and saying, I'm, I'm kind of impressed. Right? Like, that's, that's what I would have done. Or maybe he's going, hey, you, you put my, my name out there as being really generous and, and writing off some debts. So I don't want it to look like I'm not generous, or I don't want it to look like I'm not in control of what my servant is doing. Like you painted me into a corner here. Dude, good for you. Right? He's not saying I think what you did is right. What he's saying is you got me. In the Middle East, often what would happen, um, even to this day, if, if someone kind of gets you, you'll look at them and you'll stroke your beard whether you have one or not, right? And this motion here is going, okay. I'll get you back, but you got me this time, right? And it's just kind of a, 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 one of those, it could be funny, it can be serious, right? But it's just like, and you can just imagine the manager or the owner just going, all right, okay. I don't know what I'm going to do here. And he commends him for his like prudence, his shrewdness, his thinking about him preparing a soft landing so that he doesn't have to dig ditches and he doesn't have to beg. All right, so that kind of walks us through the story. Why on earth is Jesus telling this story, right? Like, what, what is going on here? And we actually pick that up in the second half of verse 8. So the first half of verse 8 is the, the owner commending him, right? Just saying, okay, good job. And then we see four, four of the sons, right? So this is Jesus now beginning to speak. And he says, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And so he's bringing up a contrast now for the disciples' sake. He's saying, the sons of this world are, are unbelievers, those who are not following God, not looking to honor God and what they're doing. The sons of light are believers, right? He says, the sons of, of this world, right, unbelievers, he said they're shrewd. They're always thinking about their future and how to handle it. They understand the way the world works. And he said, so they're doing that. He said, where the sons, in, in a way that the sons um, of light, Christians, right? Those who are following God are not. And basically he's saying this man was preparing for his future. He understood the values of his world. He understood how the world worked. And he used and manipulated those for his advantage, right? For his own benefit. He said, but... Believers are not living for this world. They're living for the age to come, right? So it's the way Peter would say, we're, this isn't our home. We are simply traveling through. We are headed to where we belong. He said, so they're focused on being shrewd in this world. He said, I'm actually going to call you to be thoughtful and preparing for the next. And so he's bringing a, this really strong contrast. He says, I want you to live by the kingdom values which will not look like the values of this world. This manager lived in a way, right, that he got what he needed, but it is going to be temporary, and it's only for this life. I want you to have eyes towards the future and the age to come. So he is drawing this really strong contrast. Consider your future. How do we live by these kingdom values, right? That's kind of the question that should be coming up in our heart and our mind now. And we then have, beginning in verse 9, three different ways that Jesus is going to tell us that we live by the kingdom's values rather than the world's values, where we can exhibit shrewdness as well. So he begins, verse 9. 
I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Um, I'll give you one word to describe what he's saying here. He's talking about being generous. Gonna, I'll help us get there. He says, I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth. When he says unrighteous wealth, he doesn't mean this is money that you get through unscrupulous ways, right? This isn't wealth that's brought in through um, illegitimate, illegal means. He is saying unrighteous simply to mean money is something people put hope in, it's something that people find security in, it's something that people seek. And he said it's unrighteous and that it will fail you. He's simply saying it's, it's a tool of this world, but it has very little eternal significance or consequence. So he's not talking about finding bad money. He's simply saying money is simply an instrument or a tool for this time. So use it, right? Use it in a way that pays off eternally, not just in this temporal world. Right? He's saying, so I want you to be generous with it, not hoardy. Right? So that when it fails, they may receive you into your eternal dwellings. So he says, listen, if you are generous with your money, if you benefit others, if you bless others, if you take care of others, right, there's going to be a day where your money is no longer going to be needed because you're going to die. It's going to fail. But there's going to be a crowd awaiting you in heaven, including God himself, who said you used it well. You used it for the way I intended it. And there are going to be those who say, man, you fed me. You housed me. You, you paid for a bill when I couldn't pay for it. You sent money to move the gospel forward in far off places. Right? He's going to say, when you've used it in the manner in which I've given it to be used, you're going to have a welcoming committee, including God himself, who welcome you saying, thank you for stewarding this tool, this instrument well. That you have eyes for the future. Right? Rather than just right now. So you're using this unrighteous, right? This, this, um, it's not, it's not holy, it's not pagan, it's just a thing. And you're using it with eyes towards eternity. Right? He tells us, not it might fail, so when it fails. So it will fail you. At, at the very least, upon your death, you're not taking it with you. It's a, it's a vapor. It's temporary. Here's the, here's the struggle for us, though. Where we know that like power and pride and success, some of those things that are um, intoxicating to us, they're, they're a true vapor in that we can chase them and can't grab them. Money is especially insidious. Because it's a vapor we can chase and we can grab. It doesn't last. It's not eternal. But we can't have it. We can't accumulate it. And we can begin to feel like it provides security and stability in a way. And he is reminding them, not it might, but it will fail. And it, you're not buying your way in to heaven. He continues, look at verse 10. So I don't want you, I, he said, I'm telling you, I want you to be generous in a culture that wasn't necessarily known for generosity. Now, in verse 10, one who is faithful in very little is faithful in much. He's talking about our character. It's like... Right? If you're faithful in a little, you'll be faithful in much. The one who is dishonest in little is dishonest in much. So if you haven't been faithful in unrighteous wealth, right? If you said if you haven't been faithful with simply with money, right? Who's going to entrust you true riches? So he says, I want your character to match. This is, are you consistently who you are in the light and when no one is seeing you? When people are watching and when people aren't. Right? It's, it's a something we try to teach our, kill, our, our children, our grandchildren, right? That you don't just obey because someone's watching and you want to avoid punishment. We want to get your heart to a place where you obey because it's, it's who you are. It's the right thing to do, whether anyone ever knows or not. And so he's simply saying, listen, if you're faithful in a little, that's going to carry over and you'll be faithful in a lot. And if you're not faithful in a little... Don't think that all of a sudden you're going to change your stripes when you're given more money, more responsibility, more relationship, that all of a sudden you're just like, oh, now that I have more, now I'll be faithful. It's like your character, right, is, is shown whether it's with little or with much. 
He continues. So if you've not been faithful with what that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? Right? He's referring back now to the manager. <coughs> you didn't you didn't take care of someone else's stuff. Why would you take care of your own? So would your would your character be consistent? And then he gives a third. So he said generosity, consistent character, and now in verse 13. No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. He's simply saying, like, living by the world's values and the kingdom's values are not congruent. You cannot make them match. Right? You cannot somehow kind of ride the fence and do both. It's like you're going to have to choose. Right? That there are two paths before you. You're following the world's values or you're following the kingdom, the kingdom of God's values. They're not leading to the same place and you can't walk both paths. Like the paths are far enough apart, you can't walk them at the same time. Like you're going to have to pick one and head that direction or pick the other one and head that direction. So like you can't do both of these So the question before us is, where is your heart this morning regarding money? Right? Because, because your, your allegiance is being demanded. Either by the values of this world which are ruled by money, or by King Jesus. And as he is comparing and contrasting these two, right? He's looking to, to help us kind of distinguish and define, like, What's going on in my own heart, in my own mind, in my own actions, in the way that I'm handling these? Because, listen, our culture is consistently, constantly, 24-7, discipling you into believing you need to live by their values, which include money being security. Right? They, it, we, it just is. Right? Versus some of the values we've already seen in Luke. Listen to just one instance here. Fear not, little flock. This is Luke 12. For it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions. Give to the needy. Provide yourself with money bags that don't grow old. With a treasure in the heavens that does not fail. Where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Right? This is in the same chapter where we have the parable of the rich fool. Who, put, who tried to build bigger barns. In verse 21 it says, So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and isn't rich towards God. Right? He's saying the values of this world and the kingdom's values are incongruent. So which ones are we going to live by? So the first is this, as we begin to think through some practical, how do we view money? That we see money as the tool that it is. Right? That it's, that it's simply something that is in this world, right, that we are able to utilize to either honor the Lord or dishonor the Lord. And there's really not a lot of middle ground there. And so he's saying, I want you to take this, this thing that will eventually fail when you're no longer in this world, and I want you to be generous with it. I want you to think of it hold it loosely and give freely and give generously. Verse 9. But what does the world tell us? To hoard. To hold. To keep. Right? And as we begin to pursue it, typically we become more selfish, we become proud, we become stingy. Right? None of which become look like the kingdom. So, how do we view finances and wealth? That we see it rightly. That we have received it. Right? We are managers of it. But it belongs ultimately to King Jesus. He owns it all. And he's allotted to you a portion of it. To be used as a tool for his kingdom's sake. For the benefit of others around you. Right? To help loosen the grip of your heart and your hands on it. Right? But typically when we think of our finances, our bank account, the initial thought is not, this belongs to the Lord, how would you have me spend it? It 
because it belongs to me. Right? So are we seeing it rightly as to who the owner is and who the manager of it is? The third thing is it's a tool. We need to see it rightly with humility. But the finances don't define us. They don't define us. Do you notice there are no qualifiers in this passage? He doesn't say, once you have X amount of money, then you have to live by this standard or by this expectation. This is a call to all believers for money not to grip our hearts, for not to hold us, because you don't have to have any for it to hold you. You can have nothing, and you can be devoted to having some and to having more. Right? You can begin to say, this passage isn't for me because I'm not wealthy. But Jesus doesn't qualify it. It is an issue for all of us. It's not just for those who have more money than us. It doesn't define you. And so whether you have a little or a lot, or you have had a little and a lot, you're not better or worse. You're just, it doesn't define you. And yet we know that the world is constantly, the culture is constantly telling us, it does. The brands that you wear matter. The vacations that you take matter. The experiences that you have matter. That which you provide for your children, right? And making sure they have every, like The world is constantly saying that matters. So what do you have to have? You have to have more money so that you begin to get on a path that's devoted to getting more so that you can have more because it defines you. And Jesus is saying, I'm trying to free you from this. That that money will fail you. It's only temporarily, it doesn't matter. See it rightly. It's, it's mine and your task with managing it. It's a tool to be generous with. It doesn't define you. Jesus defines you. Because he calls us sons and daughters. He brings us into the family and gives us a seat at the table, whether we have a lot or a little. Our finances are never a part of that equation. Ultimately, a huge part of what's happening here in Luke 16 is he's telling us don't trust in your resources. Don't depend on them for your security. It's like, right? Because that's why he calls it unrighteous money. Because our wealth, our resources, our possessions are wooing us and saying, trust me, if you have enough, you have some strong ground to stand on, you can make it through inflation, you can do right. It's telling us you need this, you need this, you need this. And Jesus is saying what? You need me. I'm the firm foundation. Right? I'm the house of the wise one. When you build upon the strong rock foundation, which is Jesus, right? This, the storms still come, but the house still stands. And when you build on a shaky foundation, and wealth, finances, possessions are a shaky foundation, the storms come, and sometimes the house stands, and sometimes it gets blown away. And he's like, you can trust me. You can be anchored in me. You can be secure in me. Trust me. Wow, like, we know this one's hard, right? Because there's just an amount of money that we like to see that just makes us feel a little better. A little more secure. And what that's doing is it's, it's taking our heart's allegiance and saying, Jesus, I don't know that you're going to come through, but this will. Jesus, is a warning to us. Do we see him as sufficient as our provider? Right? That he will care for us. That he knows our needs and will care for us and, and give us what we need and provide. Next, is our resources, our possessions, our finances are an opportunity for obedience. Listen, hear me. Jesus here is not saying you have to take a vow of poverty. Right? We don't see that anywhere here. It is a call to obedience. And so he may ask something of you that doesn't seem to make sense in the world's values. I want you to spend that money. Jesus, why? Because I asked you to. I asked you to. 
I want you to bless and to give and to give freely because it's holding your heart, and I want you to give. But Jesus, everyone's going to think I'm crazy. Which which kingdom, which values are you living by? Right? Like, and it's, it's releasing the hold that it has on our heart. He is not simply saying, today, go home and liquidate everything you've had and make sure you've got nothing. He's saying, no, see it rightly as a tool that's been placed in your hand to be used and led and guided by King Jesus. Right? To, to be used for his glory. We know that our culture and money is just insidious. It is constant and it is creeping in all the time. This is something that you can put to death and say, okay, Jesus, it's yours. What do you want me to do with it? And then right later on, you're like, it's mine. Right? Like kind of you pull a golem and you're like, Jesus, it's mine. And you can go back and forth throughout your life in that. Right? Because it's just a constant drip, a constant creep, a constant attack saying you need to have more, you need to hold more. This is your hope. This is your security. And Jesus is saying, please don't waste your life. Please don't waste your life devoting it to the gaining of wealth and riches that will simply fail. But live by the values of my kingdom. Trusting me as your provider, as the one that will satisfy you, as the one who will direct you. If you want to, if you want to meditate and consider and read more on this, um, 1 Timothy 6 would be a great place, kind of in conjunction with Luke 16 this week. Um, Paul finishes his letter to Timothy, and he just he, he's, there's some warnings for the, the wealthy in the world and how we consider poverty, how we consider wealth, how we consider riches, how we consider action, and what are actual good works. We don't have time to get into that this morning in the first Timothy 6. All right. So for a lot of us, here's the question that's going to be ringing in our hearts and our minds right now. What about me? Like, what about me? Like, this terrifies me. What am I going to do if I don't have enough? What am I going to do if people think something of me? What am I going to do if I have lack? What am I going to do? Church, it is a, a place for us to go. Say, you say you're my father. Do I really believe that? Do I really trust that you care for me? That you see me? That you know the needs and the demands of this world and that you're going to provide for me? Do we really believe that we can go to him in prayer? To a generous father and ask and that he will provide and care for us? Do we really believe that he will sustain us? And that sometimes when we lack something that we think we should have, it's really him showing us that we didn't need it as much as we thought. And he's, he's peeling our fingers back and taking our grip off and lifting our chin to look more at him. So this isn't a call to a comparison game of who's giving more, but it's a call of obedience. What is Jesus asking of me? And am I willing to do that? Even if it does not match the advice of the world. Because he's saying this man, this dishonest, true money manager, lived in light of the rules of this world and provided for himself for his future that was temporary. And he's saying, but I want you to live in light of the kingdom's values, knowing right that there's an eternal dwelling for you. It is lasting and is permanent. So you're actually not a fool, you are shrewd and you are wise to live in light of that which will last forever rather than that which will fade away in best case in 70, 80, 90 years. He's calling us to see the two paths and to walk on the one that we would live in light of our possessions and see that those are in, in, in light. We would live in light of Jesus' call on our possessions. Then again, it's not a call to just sell it all and to be done with it today, but to use it for his glory, for the benefit of those around us. Okay. So what if we haven't done this well? What if right now we're going, <laughs> nope. Jesus, I'm going to rob that fence. 
that we would see this as the warning that it is. That we're not riding the fence as much as we think we are. That we're actually not following Jesus in that. But that we're following the, the values of the world. And what is what is Luke consistently been showing us from the time that John the Baptist grew? What do we do when we see that the way we're living is not honoring to God? It's not pleasing to him. It's not in line with the kingdom. We repent. We say, Jesus, I'm now aware that the way that I've been thinking or giving or hoarding or, or doing or not, I, is not what you would have for me. I want what you have for me. So I'm going to repent of this. And I'm going to bow a knee in submission and say, you are the king of my life and I will do whatever you ask. Because you have done what I could not do and you've rescued me. You brought me right back to the Father and right relationship. And so this is both a challenge to our hearts, but it's also a warning. It's an opportunity for repentance. It's an opportunity to be reminded of the good news that we, none of us, have done this perfectly. We have all wanted and been envious and covetous. We have all um, hoarded. We have all not been generous. Like all of us have had those opportunities and have failed. And yet Jesus was faithful and perfect and in all. And he said, I want you. I'm calling you to be mine. I've done what you could not do. And through his life, his death, and his resurrection, he has made us right with the Father. And the question before us then is, which path are we walking? The kingdom of this world or the kingdom of God's? I want you to hear... This is from Hebrews 13. This is verse 5. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man do. Right, Hebrews wraps up that sermon in three lines. There's a warning. Don't love money. Why? Because God is with us. So, what can man do? What can the world do? What can our culture do? Because we trust him and we are looking towards the future hope. And we are wise and shrewd in doing that. Let's pray. Father, even now, the enemy would want to lie and tell us this, this wasn't for us, that we don't have that much, that you're not going to provide, that you're not faithful. Lord, it's the same trick from the garden where we are taught told to trust in something other than you, that you aren't as good as you say you are, that you aren't as faithful as you say you are, that you aren't sufficient, and that you aren't with us. Lord, and those are lies meant to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And so right now, when we recognize those lies being whispered in our hearts and our minds, God, would we trust that you are for us, that you are with us, and that you are good Father. And that you will care for us and provide for us. Lord, would we trust that and would our souls be anchored in that? And Father, right now, if we're grieving our own mistakes, if we're feeling the weight of that, even this morning, God, that you would remind us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That in our confession of our sin, God, that there is forgiveness and grace that far outruns it. God, that you have been faithful where you were, and so we can, we can lean in your faithfulness. And Father, moving forward, we desire and long to live by the values of your kingdom in this world for your glory. You guys stand or sit with us this morning. Let's respond together to the Lord.